got my notes off of it. Good evening. Let's make sure I'm on. Can you check? Yes, I do. Looks like we're loading up. Good evening, everybody. Hey, Will. How you doing, Bill? Good evening, Antoinette, Lou. Good evening. Just give me a shout as you come on. Just say good evening so I know you're there. I can't see you if you don't say something. Just say good evening. Just put GE in there. I know you're there. All right. We're so glad that you guys are joining us tonight for our Bible study. I think we're in a very important subject. Um, I will see. Good evening. Hey, Beverly. <laughs> Good evening, Don. <laughs> uh, I think we're on a very important subject. I think um, we are truly living in the last day. We're truly living uh, in the last hour, as John described it on last week. He called it hours. I was going on for 2,000 years. I heard someone um, on TikTok and passing by the other day said, I don't believe we're in the last days. I'm like, well, you're, you're contradicting what Scripture tells us about. He was talking about the Bible, too, but it's it's um, it's um just um, amazing the amount of, I shouldn't say amazing, the amount of error that goes on on the platform of social media. And I try my best to be as biblical as I can, study much as I can to make sure I bring you what the Word is saying. You can follow me if you open your Bibles up to First John, second chapter, starting at verse 18, I read uh, 18, 19, and 20 again, and we'll dig into what we left off last week. I try to see, let you see that, um, try to be as um, um, contextual as I can. I try to be as, um, to go with the context of the, the book, the writer, as I can to make sure we're getting what the writer intended, not something based on my imagination or cherry picking verse, verses that I want and avoiding others. So it's it, the Bible is a, you don't throw your mind away. You, you need your mind. Amen. You need to, to think through the text. Yes, uh, salvation is simplistic, but discipleship costs you, costs you time to study, reading, uh, reconsider, rethinking things, being um, transformed by the new of mind. It's a cost to discipleship. And we should be studying to be better disciples. Amen. Christ did not say, go forth and make church members. Go forth and fill your building. He said, go forth and make disciples. Amen. So we're not making disciples. We've just opened the door to salvation without uh, allowing people opportunity to grow. And growing means that I have to be willing, I have to be teachable. I have to be willing to change um, what I thought about certain situations. I thought about myself as God shows me because God is always right whether I, whether I agree or not. God is always right in what he says and what he does. Amen. God is always exact in what he says. He never He never changes his mind. Uh, what was wrong in the Old Testament is wrong now. What is true is back then is true now. And true is not new. Amen. Everything is true. It's been around for a long time. But we have the enemy. We're talking about the Antichrist. So as we come tonight, um, join me in the word of prayer as we come before the Father uh, as we um, seek to come to his word. Father, we are so grateful tonight for your living word, your loving word, your powerful word, your love book, 66 books to tell us how much you care. And we come tonight, God, just seeking on a very serious situation that we would come to give us, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to receive, oh God. That the word would go forth tonight with great power and conviction and somebody's life might be altered because they came this way this night. And we thank you for your many blessings and commit every listening ear to you, God, that you will be the teacher. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So um, let me read the verses that under consideration and give you once again the outline of these three verses. Little children, I'm in 1 John 2nd chapter, starting in verse 18, verses 18, 19, and 20. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. I'm in the New King James Version. Even now, many Antichrists have come by which you know, by which we know that the last, that, that it is the last hour. Verse 19, they went out from us, 
but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things. I have not written unto you because you do not know the truth. I'm in verse 21 now. That'd be for next time. But because you know it, and there is no lie of the truth. So we do a truth as we move on. But I wanted to go down. I read to 21. We're only going to cover um, 18, 19, and 20. All right. So verse 18 gives us the, the, da the danger. The danger that's going on. It's the, the present danger, the deception and danger. Verse 19 shows us how people are leaving the truth. It's called the defection. So you have the danger of defection. And then um, verse 20 gives us what we need is discernment. The Holy Spirit gives to us his children discernment. So you have danger, defection, discernment. All right. And those, that's just a slight outline of the verses, of these three verses. Danger, deception, and discernment. I want to look at the text in a general way and come back and kind of dig into it a little bit. All right. Let me just look into this verse a little bit and we'll dig into it. Little children, John's talking to us. Amen. We are little children of God. It is the last hour. We talked about that. The last hour is that period between after Jesus Christ um, was risen until now. As you as you have heard, he says, you heard this before. The Antichrist is coming. That's future. The Antichrist is coming. That's future. All right? Antichrist is coming. He goes to say, even now, many Christ have come. So there's Antichrist now. There's Antichrist who is coming. That's speaking of a particular person that's coming in the future. But the spirit of Antichrist is working through people right now. Y'all follow? See the difference there? Future Antichrist, present Antichrist has already come. He says have come, which means in John's day, in the first century, the spirit of Antichrist was alive and well. So we talked about Antichrist on last week. Anti meaning against, right? Against or um, in opposition to and also in place of. So Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, you know it's, it's empowered by Satan himself. Opposes everything that is of God. And this anti-God, anti-Christ spirit we mentioned on last week started in the Garden of Eden. When God gave a word, the third chapter of, of Genesis, check it out. You read it before, but think through the story. The third chapter, Adam and Eve had a word from God. But the first thing Satan says, has God said? And as soon as what God has said comes under question, that's the spirit of Antichrist. Because there's no question as to what God says. And before you knew it, the conversation went on, and Eve's doing exactly the opposite of what God told her to do. Does that sound like today? <laughs> to me, it sounds like today's newspaper. I think through society, I look at the news sometimes and think through the society and things be going on politically, um, socially, the crime, the climate that's going on now, financially, and I look at all the things that are happening. If you look at what's happening and people are trying to say Christianity tries to control you, Christianity is brainwashed and all those other things you're going to say. But you think about it. If there was true Christianity, true, truly Christ in the hearts of men, Target wouldn't have to close 20 stores because of theft. Every time I go to the store, my wife and I both, we go to the store shop. And I don't care how many checks and balances they put in place, I see people just blatantly just stealing. Right in front of my eyes. Not scanning stuff, hiding stuff. But if you're a Christian, what keeps me from stealing? Not because I'm a nice person. Nice people steal. <laughs> Amen. Which keeps me from trying to get over on somebody. 
or lying or cheating is because I realize I'm accountable to God. Not only accountable to him, but I actually love him. I love him enough that I want my behavior to glorify him. So I'm not trying to get saved. I'm already saved. He saved me. Amen. How many know the moment you believe he justified you? But now that you are a believer, he wants to sanctify you. In justification, he declares you righteous. But in sanctification, he makes you righteous. Amen. And we have to participate in the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. What I mean participate? We don't do the work. We yield to him, the Holy Spirit who lives us, in us. He does the work through us. The only ability we need is availability. That means when I have a choice to make, I need to make that choice, the choice that glorifies the Lord. Antichrist is coming. Antichrist is already here. Already was in John's day, already is right now day. He says, by which you know the last, I'm still in verse um, 18, by which you know the Antichrist, by, by which you know that the last hour, it's the last hour. So that's a sign. The sign of the last hour in verse 18, is letting us know one of the signs of the last hour is that Antichrist is alive and well right now. Antichrist is a spirit that is against Christ, tries to replace Christ. As I said, um, I'm not sure if I said this on um, at doing the service or doing the last week's class, but I see some crazy stuff. I see people online have a platform, and one woman declares that she's the Almighty God, that her son is Jesus Christ. And I look on this stuff and I'm, I'm, and I'm just just wondering. Somebody's actually giving her audience, listening to her. But um, it's, 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 I'm speechless when I hear this kind of stuff. But Christ told us. Now, I'll come to that verse a little later. But Christ said there'll be false Christ. Many will say they're Christ in, in that day. So we're living in those days today. Um, so that's verse the danger. The danger is a real danger out here. Uh, verse 19. Uh, the 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 um, departure from the truth. Uh, verse nineteen tells us the defection, the leaving of the truth. This can become very confusing if you don't know that this is what's expected. Right now, people are leaving Christianity by the thousands each day. People who have served as missionaries, people who have served as pastors. People that have gone to get their doctorate degree in religious studies and got to a place of study and realized that the stuff that, that I've learned has convinced me that Christianity is not true. And they turn back. So there's a big defection. And if you're not aware of this, some of us live in our little shells. We don't broaden our think, thinking to see there's other things going on in the world. Man, no, I'm here to let you know that there's a big defection going on today. And many of them are voicing their, they call it uh, deconstruct, deconstructing their religion. So they go back and re-examine what they believe and, and, and decide on their own whether it is true and what they've been taught. And they're re-evaluating everything, you know. And it's okay to re-evaluate. We should stand back and re-evaluate what we believe to make sure we're believing the true. We, all, we have a faith that can be examined. We have a faith that is historical. We have a faith you can research. We have a Jesus Christ who actually lived died and rose again. We have eyewitnesses to the account. We have four gospels that are historically correct and considered um, history. We have a, a, a um, Dr. Luke who was a historian in biblical days who jotted down not only the story of Christ, but also early church in the book of Luke. And these documents that are placed, historical documents, um, have more credibility than a lot of our history books. Because there's so many copies of them that have been passed down through the century. We weren't there to see these things happen, but I wasn't there when John, oh, I wasn't there when George Washington, when he chopped the cherry tree, got an apple or something, whatever he did. But I believe it. The first Abraham Lincoln was around. I, I wasn't there. But so what proof do I have that he actually existed because somebody wrote about him? And some of the documentation that wrote about him, um, there there can be hundreds of documentation about Abraham Lincoln, but there's thousands of of documentations, uh, copies of scripture. Thousands and thousands, still finding things. 
and finding old uh, evidence of the text. And it's intact. People say the Bible was written by man. Who else going to write it? <laughs> Who else going to write it? Every book is written by man. But we, we give more credibility to an author of our day than we would an author from a thousand years ago. Although we know the, clo the closer you are to the truth, the more truth you have. So um, thousands of documents have been there. So we know, and from what I see compared to um, truth, what truth is, the truth has not changed at all. To Satan is still doing the same lie. He's still telling people that um, they can be like God. All they have to do is get rid of God to be like God. And this is the same lie he's telling now. Uh, I see no difference in that than what's now. And we need, people say, well, the Bible is controlling. We, can you, have you seen what happened when man is out of control? Prisons, theft, riots. We need uh, to be under control. Why not be under God's control? Somebody's going to, is the spirit controlling you whether you like it or not? I just prefer to have God control in my life. Amen. I want him to take more, the more control he gets, the more in control I am. Amen. The more um, obedient I am, the better the people around me, my family benefits, my, the jobs you work benefit, the society benefits, and the closer we are to God. So don't let people convince you out. So I just want to let you know there's the big defection. So this defection happening, verse 19, they went out from us. The thing about they went out from us that's um, really telling to me is that they were once a part of us. This is what John's saying. John is saying that there's doctrinally, there's believers that have gathered together and there are different groups that have been with us, but they didn't stay with us. They didn't stay along with the truth, they departed from the truth, which means they were apart one time, but now they defected from it. He says they went out from us. They, they left. They defected from us. All right? And let me tell you a test of what's real. One of the tests of what's real is, first of all, you got to lay, lay it against the truth. Then you got to lay it against time. Time. Time tells. He says they went out from us I'm in verse 19. I'm still writing the text. Haven't touched my notes for the night at all. I'm right, reading the text. They went out from us, but conjunction of contrast. John says this. They were not of us. They were with us in the fellowship, but they really weren't one of us. Wow. And so we can... Look at Antichrist being what? A anti being to take the place of. They were pretending. They were the uh, tares. Verse chapter 13 of Matthew. The tares among the wheat. They were the Judas among the disciples. You got to think in mind that Judas participated in the miracles and teaching of Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, one of you not, is not of us. One of you has no part with me. He knew who Jesus, Judas was, although he was there. Amen. So we got to understand, just because someone goes to church and talks church talk doesn't mean that they are really of us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Doesn't mean they're of us. Being of us. Let me give you a few verses. I'm going to give you a few verses here. Matthew, you don't have to go to these. I'll read them. Just jot the verses down and come back to them in your study. Matthew 24 and 5. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Many going to come in the name of Christ saying they're Christ. But how many things have I seen over in Africa? Different, you, you have a man that says he's Jesus. He has a following. They do anything for him. So this stuff is happening today. And will what? It's, it's not that it's not going to work. He said, this is Jesus talking. They're going to come in my name. They're going to say, I am Christ. I'm the Christ. And they're going to deceive many people. Um, 24-1, the same chapter, 24-1. Uh, Matthew 24-1. Again, jot it down if you can't get to it right now. Jot it down for a time of study. I'm going to go through them quickly. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders. Why? To deceive, if possible, even the elect. We're going to talk about that in discernment a little while. We have a helper in our discernment, the Holy Spirit. We have an anointing from God. So false Christs are going to come. False prophets are going to come. They're going to rise up 
and they're going to have signs of power. They're going to show, good evening, Karen. They're going to show um, signs and wonders for the reason of deception. And even the very elect, those chosen of God, will can be can almost be tricked into this. And we have, um, let me give you, this is, we'll come to this a little later in John, 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is a Christ, he is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. All right, just a few verses of this. They were not from us because they were not of us. I'm back in our text again. The Antichrist is coming. Um, we know he is. Verse 19, they went out from us. So they who? They really are the Antichrist. With John 19, verse 19, the they here, they went out from us. Who are they? They were the Antichrist referred to in verse uh, 18. The Antichrist, the spirit, the one who was already there. But they were not of us. So how in the world? This is, to me, I have other verses uh, I will maybe go to a little later. But this is the most dangerous. This is the most dangerous to me. Um... Because the ones that were with us know the language. Amen. They know church jargon. They know our vocabulary. They know when to say amen. They know how to dance. All the little things they know. But oftentimes, the seed was planted right in the midst of us. We don't realize. Antichrist. Um... Because um, contrary to popular opinion, Satan loves to come to church. He loves Holy Ground. Because uh, that's the place of his most activity. Where the saints are, he plants himself there. All right? He plants his own people there. They went out from us because they were not of us. Well, John begins to tell us why. For if they had been of us, Time will tell. They would have continued with us. Mm -hmm. Seeing a lot there in it. But they went out from us. Why? Why did they leave? That they might be made manifest. They went out from us so their true hand could be seen. Because they were not of us. God wanted to show this person never really was. And it's hard to tell a person who has deconstructed because they're convinced that they had the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They're convinced that um, they know all the Christian jargon. They study the text. Studying the text doesn't make you a Christian. Satan knows the text. So it doesn't make you a Christian because you know the Bible. It doesn't make you a Christian because you know the Bible. It makes you a Christian when you submit to the Bible. You submit to Jesus Christ as your Lord. Satan knows the Bible. He won't submit. Amen. He knows that Jesus is Lord. He knows stuff that a lot of Christians know. The Bible says the demons, uh, he said, you have faith. They say, they say the demons fear and tremble. They know who God is. When Jesus, oftentimes, read, read the Gospels. The demons knew more than the religious leaders. The religious leaders wouldn't accept Jesus as the Christ. But the demons said, we know who you are, Holy One. Have you come to torment us before our time? This is what they were saying. They knew who you are. Why are you troubling us now? What is, this is not our time. They knew that Je who Jesus was, they knew they had a time, a time limit to wreak, to wreak their havoc on earth. They knew who he was. James says the demons believe. You say, James said, you have faith? That's good. But demons believe and tremble. They, they, they have an emotional response. So you say, well, I cry in church. <laughs> or um, I, I, I get goosebumps when I hear a certain song. Demons have knowledge and they have emotions, mm -hmm. but they have a dead faith because they're not submitted to the Lord, or they wouldn't be demons at all, would they? All right, so uh, we have to be sure we know Christ as our Savior and Lord. So what is the essence of what I'm trying to tell you tonight? If you were to get to heaven's gate tonight, and when you got there, an angel asked you, what merits you to enter this gate? What would you say? I want you to think, what would you say that would allow you to get into heaven? What would you tell an angel? If he says, what is it that, that you have, what is it that, that enables you to come through these gates? What would you say? Some would say, I go to church every Sunday. Some would say, 
I do the best I can. Some would say I feed the sick. Some would say I try to be a good person. In other words, most people think that when they get to heaven's gates, it's going to be a scale. And they somehow think that their good deeds will outweigh their bad deeds. And therefore, they will get in on the basis of their good deeds. Most people think, even some people going to church think that. No matter how what I did on Saturday night, I'm in church this morning. Now let's get in church. We talk. Let's, let's make it in the doors of the Lord. Make it in the doors of the Lord. Some would say, well, uh, I raised my family. Some would say, I'm, I, I treat people right. But the only way that you get into the heaven is that you come through Jesus Christ. Only thing you are not going to be able to say to get there is that I'm here because I'm in Christ. I trust Christ fully and totally for my salvation. None of the other things matter, whether you're a Baptist, Methodist, whether you got baptized, whether you take communion, whether you've done a good deed. None of these things really matter. You've got to come through. What did Jesus Christ say? Now, I know what Oprah said. Oprah said as many ways to God. She said publicly, she said us. I'm not lying on her. I'm just telling you what she says. Question her, she says in many ways to God. Oprah said, that's the gospel of Oprah. And um, Joe Osteen has been recorded saying that um, somebody point blank asked him in an interview, is Jesus the only way to God? He said, that's up to God to decide. So he wouldn't pin down what the Bible says. But I hear Jesus say, John 14, he says, I am the way the truth, mm -hmm. and the life. Mm -hmm. No man come to the Father except by me. That's what he says. This epistle we see in chapter 5, I believe, that he said, if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son of God, you don't have life. Simple as that. So the only way that you get into heaven is not by what you've done. It's by who you know. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Are you trusting him only for your salvation? Everything else it's secondary to that. Amen. Now, out of a saved life, that springs good works and love and all those other things. Out of a saved life, that springs um, being a good family man, being faithful, being all these things. Out of a good, out of that heart of, of, so you're not, you're not working for salvation, you're working from salvation. Amen. God is not saying to you and I, get it together and then I'll let you in. God said, I'll let you in. Now get it together. Amen. He doesn't say, do, and you'll get in. He says, done. The moment you get in the door, he says, it's done. How do I know? Because it said on the cross, what? He said, it's finished. Amen. Nothing we can add or take from it. And if you ever doubt that that's the simplicity of the cross, go back to the gospel and read about the thief on the cross. And look at his life. And see that he was saved instantaneously. Not by what he did, but by who he accepted into his heart and life. All right? So he went out from us. But they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out. Why? So that we might really see they were never of us. So those people that are leaving. Don't get upset. Pray for them. But recognize this. That if you have been generally saved, if you're generally God's elect, there's no leaving this thing. Amen. And I'm a witness because I tried to leave myself. I had tried to, to, to say, you know what? Not really leave being saved, but leave ministry. Just fed up. Just... um. Tired, just weary of the battle, the rejection, and the being de de devalued in ministry to the point I was just going to, and some of you are with me, you understand, you just want to leave all the politics and functions and have church in your house because there's too much confusion at church. I didn't decide to church at the house of first. I decided that I was going to leave and just go and sit in somebody else's church and not even let them know that I had ever been ordained. I was just going to go 
and be a member. Now you're going to member. Just go to church and enjoy the service. That lasted one or two weeks. <laughs> then I was discontent because I felt like there was more call in my life and I still feel that way. Amen. I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't a call. I'm not doing it for money. I'm not doing it for fame or fortune. I'm doing it because I believe God placed me here to do this call and finish it. Amen. To finish the work. So these are the things we go through. So we, it went out from us because they would never of us because they would continue with us. All right. Verse 20. This is the, the we need discern. We have, I want you to know, not only do we need discernment, I want you to know tonight that the discerner lives inside you. Y'all get what I said to you? The discerner lives inside you. They went out from us because they were not of us. He says, but, conjunction again of contrast, you have an anointing. Who has an anointing? Every child of God. In the life we like to say, oh, child, he's anointed. She's anointed. Why? Because we feel something. We, we feel sense some power. But I want you to know you're anointed. Amen. You may not be in a pulpit. You may not think of yourself as being a powerful person or whatever people think of themselves. But I'm reading scripture tonight. John is writing to believers. He says, but you have an anointing. Anointing is an unction, an enablement that you didn't purchase or buy. And even the youngest Christian, the youngest believer has this unction. And this unction, this anointing is from the Holy One. God has given us this anointing. God has given us of his spirit. Amen. God has given us his spirit. Why? So we can discern. We can see what is and what isn't. Amen. And you may not even be spiritually mature enough to have the knowledge to separate. Because none of us have all knowledge in the script. We just all learn it. All of us are disciples. But the Holy Spirit in you will let you know whether something's right or wrong. If you read John 10, you'll see what Jesus said about his sheep. Most of you guys know it. He said, my sheep know my voice. Amen. So when someone's speaking and it doesn't seem like they're speaking from God, something just won't sit right with you. It's not a feeling. It's, a, it's an unction. The Holy One let you know this is not the place for me. This is not uh, what I want. This is not where I should be because the anointing is in you. How many know you're anointed tonight? It's not just a preacher, the pastor. Not just the one that sings with power. Or what we think is power. It's the power that the Holy One, the Holy Spirit is the anointing. He's the builder. Jesus Christ, although he could have operated independently because he's God all by himself. He operated the earth under the anointing. He didn't do anything until... As he was baptized, the spirit descended upon him uh, in the form of a dove in Luke chapter 4. And he said what happened to him. He explained to the, those in the congregation that next day, that same day, he said, the spirit of the Lord has come upon me. He said, what? Anointed me to preach. He operated under the power of the spirit of God. That's the same thing God has called us to do. Amen. To operate not on our own skill. And every time I start doubting my skill... I doubt my preaching ability. I doubt my knowledge. God reminds me, Michael, it's not you. Amen. It is the Holy Spirit. I think sometimes, am I getting across the message across to the people? Am I teaching them? Are they really getting it or catching it? God reminds me again, Michael, you are not to teach. It's right here in this verse. Mm -hmm. He says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. What does that really mean? I, who knows everything? Nobody knows it all, but what happens is the Spirit of God in you knows everything. He'll give you the power to know whether it's an Antichrist or whether it's of Him. He gives us the power to discern. And so I'm learning this. Some as time as leaders, you think that um, only you get it. No, but every child of God gets Him, gets the Holy Spirit. Amen. The moment you believe, the Spirit of God comes into your life. And he baptizes you into the body of Christ. <laughs> Many people get the baptism and the filling, the filling of the Spirit confused. And, uh, you know, we can argue semantics and all these other things. But if you read Scripture, you'll find out 
There's only one baptism, but there's many feelings. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we get the baptism. We'll say when the spirit falls on someone, oh, um, they got baptized in the spirit. But we never we never commanded to get baptized in the spirit. That's something the spirit does its own self. All believers are baptized. John uh, 1 Corinthians 12 tells us we are all, as fleshy as the Corinthians was, Paul said we've all been baptized by the spirit in the one body. All of us. Then it comes another time. It comes the moment you believe the Spirit of God baptizes you. Now that you're in the body, we are commanded in Ephesians 5 to be filled. That's different. Being baptized, the Spirit does that. But being filled, we have to cooperate with the Spirit in our lives to fill our lives. Being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean shouting. Being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean yelling. Being filled with the Spirit, not necessarily speaking in tongues. Being filled with the Spirit is that when the Holy Spirit now controls your life. The God that lives in you now reigns through you. God lives in all of us. Once we believe in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God comes in to live. Mm -hmm. And I like somebody said it, and I like the, I like the way someone explained I got it from somewhere. I don't know where, but I remember re hearing someone said it. It's so good. He resides in us the moment we believe. He lives. There's no doubt. You have, John said what? You have an anointing. You have the Holy Spirit in you. It's not a question whether he resides. The question is whether he presides. Amen. Is he in control of me? Galatians 5 tells us, if you're led by the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. When the Spirit of God is leading our lives, he's the one that gives us victory over temptation. Me and myself, how many, how many of y'all have tried to overcome stuff? Over and over again, trying to overcome, 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 trying to overcome stuff, trying to try and try and try. Not, I'm not going to do that, not do that, I'm not going to do that. And all, all you make it stop for a few days, but then it comes back on you again. I've learned to stop relying on yourself. Paul said, when I would do good, evil is present with me. Galatians 5 say, the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. So you can't do the things you want to do. In other words, you're powerless. Even knowing the right stuff, you're powerless to do the things you want, you need to do because we need help from God. So we need the Spirit of God living in us, not only living, but presiding over our lives. Amen. Mm -hmm. He calls the shots now. No longer call the shots. And this is important. It's important for the Christian life. I was reading today about um, we used to have, we used to focus mainly on virtues. Um, virtues, the Christian virtues were really um, foundational for the Christian church back in the day. You don't hear anything about prudence anymore. Prudence is the idea of having wisdom to make decisions with the forethought of knowing the outcome. If I make a bad decision today, I realize it's going to come up the next day. I'm going to reap what I sow. Amen. So prudence tells me not to do this because it's going to be a bad outcome. Ah, our time is gone already. Yes. So prudence, prudence tells me, prudence tells me that. And um, we have to think about uh, the outcome of our decision making. And so I can sow bad seeds in my life. And that could be what I hear, what I eat, what I do. But the Bible says in Galatians 5 that don't be, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. Amen. So keep these things in mind that God wants us to, to have um, lives that are making wise decisions, sowing good things into our lives and thereby sowing into other people's lives. So the, we don't think about the Christian being virtuous in that sense. That, some other verses I'll talk about another time. My time has just escaped us and I haven't really touched my notes yet. But I'm just, I think that we get the idea of this, of this verse, this journey. We have this anointing. Um, from the fall, we know, and we know all things. He gives us the understanding. We hear the voice. You may not, you may not know what verse and chapter is in, but something don't, that something doesn't sit right with you, and someone not coming from the scripture, then you ought to be able to question that, and get your Bible and spend time in prayer to seek and find out what God is really saying. Study it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't point you to me. I'm pointing you to the verse. All we did tonight was go to the verses, didn't we? We went to the verses and read those verses. I didn't add anything to them, take anything. I tried to read those verses and explain as clearly as possible what I believe God is saying to our lives through these verses. Beware, Antichrist is here. 
There's a great defection going on, but don't be discouraged because the very elect could be fooled by these people, but God has given us an unction so we'll know what to do and what not to do. And in the end, if you're truly his, you'll still be standing. Amen. If you're really his, you'll tru truly still be standing when it's all said and done. God bless you, family. I got to leave now. I, try I promise to keep you um, 45 minutes. I want to be true to that. And I have so much more to give to you. I have a lot to share with you. I feel like I have to scratch the surface each time I think um, I've exhausted the subject. God just keeps pouring more in. So I want you guys to study uh, this passage, meditate on this passage, and look. We didn't get to the other names of Antichrist. He's not just known as Antichrist. He's known of, as a man of sin, the beast out of the sea, um, uh, the lawless one. And we'll get to those at another time to talk about his various aliases, but it's the same person. Amen. How he's alive and well and working against the things of God even now. God bless you, family. Um, please come be with us once again next Thursday. Also, join us on Sunday morning for our Sunday School 845. Our service is at 10. We're both live in our West location on North Rolling Road, um, 2516 North Rolling Road on Sunday morning for Sunday School and services. And then um, the following other services will be at our uh, Hoffa County location, our virtual location. And also, I don't have the dress in front of me, but we're going to be visiting church on the um, third Sunday this month. Those details are going to be posted on our page. We're visiting out that morning. We have service from, service from that location that morning on the third Sunday. Um, so God bless you. May heaven's riches of uh, blessings be upon your life as we depart in prayer this day. We don't depart from God's presence. We thank you, Lord, right now for this time together. We pray, oh God, that somehow some word has been imparted to encourage some life, oh God. Let your seed be planted deeply in the hearts of your people. May it bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you, family. Kingdom Praise Ministry is signing out from our Bible study. God bless you.